Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another Q&A video on Forgotten Weapons. I'm Ian McCollum, and today I only have two pages of questions, but they're printed really, really small, so there's pretty much as many of them as we normally have. And today, courtesy of a couple of wonderful Irish gentlemen, I have a bottle of Teeling Pot Stilled Irish Whiskey. So that should be quite nice. As always, as always, uh, these questions come to me from the awesome folks at Patreon, and uh, so let's get right into it. Our first question is from John, who says, are there any rifles with pistol style three dot sights? And the answer is yes, sort of. So the three dot style of sight is really a U notch or sometimes V notch rear sight that's had white dots added so that the sights can be picked up very quickly in, say, low light conditions. So there are lots of rifles that have U notch style rear sights. But generally speaking, the idea of quick acquisition of rifle sights in low light isn't really the same sort of thing as it is with pistols. However, there are a few instances where it is namely night sights for rifles. So uh, I actually have a video coming that I've filmed, but I haven't edited or scheduled yet, on uh, British and German World War I night sights on rifles. And they, they look very much like the traditional pistol style three dot sights. You've got a U notch on the back of the sight with two dots on either side, and a dot right in the middle of the front sight. Uh, the French also did the same thing. So yes, there are three dot rifle sights. Uh, next question is from Chatty, uh, and this is a repeat question that I am finally answering. It says, I understand that barrel length does not dramatically affect accuracy beyond a certain point. Why are snub-nosed machine guns not more widespread? I'd imagine it could be useful to save weight or not protrude from firing ports in vehicles. Um, I think the main reason is that, uh, well, noise and blast. So until really quite recently, and to some extent still not today, troops don't wear ear protection in combat. And that's, on the one hand, that's a thing that affects them long term uh, with their hearing, but it's also a short term thing. It's an immediate, like, if a gun is so loud that you can't hear what other people around you are doing or saying, if it makes your ears ring so badly in the immediate aftermath uh, that you can't communicate with, say, the rest of your machine gun team, that's a problem. And this is a problem that militaries recognize. You can see in a number of cases military organizations reject guns on the basis of being too loud, too much blast. Uh, the shortened tanker, quote unquote, version of the M1 Garand is a good example. Uh, they rejected it because it had too much noise and blast. And if you were to cut a belt-fed machine gun down to, say, a 14, 16, 12, 18-inch barrel, you're going to get a lot of noise and blast out of it. Uh, and while it's not affecting accuracy, it does affect muzzle velocity, and muzzle velocity affects drop, and so you are in some ways limiting the effective range of, of a machine gun by cutting it down like that. And while, say, 800 to 1,000 yard effective range may not be relevant on a rifle for single point engagement, it is more relevant on a machine gun. So there are a couple reasons why they didn't ever really do super shorty machine guns. Uh, Commander31 says, is the mass of the bolt or bolt carrier group important in a roller delayed rifle? Yes, uh, it may not be the most important factor, that would be the angle of the, the delay locking wedge, uh, but it's definitely a relevant factor and something that has to be taken into account. Because the lighter that that bolt carrier is, the faster it will move back under the force of the energy that comes back through the, the rollers and the wedge. So if it's too light, it'll open too quickly, and if it's too heavy, uh, it will maybe open too late, which may cause problems with extraction, or it may slow down the rate of fire to a level that's undesirable. Um, but yeah, it is the, the weight of the bolt carrier group is, in fact, important. Uh, John says, I must have a substantial firearms collection. How do I look after them? Not just the normal cleaning after use, but do I have a quote unquote maintenance re regime? And that's a question that a bunch of people have asked, and I've always kind of put it off, because frankly, the answer is I really don't. Um, 
I have the good fortune to live in Arizona, which is a warm, very dry place. So my guns are always in an air-conditioned building, because here in Arizona, especially in the summer, if it's not air-conditioned it's really not habitable for humans. Uh, and so the air conditioning kind of dries the air out even more than it normally would be, or, or keeps it at a nice static level. Um, I don't have to worry about rust, I just put guns up on a rack, make sure that they're, you know, obviously I don't leave corrosive salts in them after firing corrosive ammo, I'll clean that out. Um, guns that are in the white I make sure to have a, a bit of a protective coat of oil on, and I don't go around you know, getting greasy fingerprints on them unnecessarily. But beyond that, here in the southern Arizona desert there really isn't any regimen that I have to, uh, to pay attention to. They just sit and they're good. Tom B says, the latest US military program to replace the M16 platform, the NGSW, has adopted a cartridge that on paper looks similar in recoil to 7.62 NATO. Uh, barring a muzzle device, is there a realistic way to reduce the recoil of something like that down to 5.56 M4 carbine levels? Uh, no, not really. Um, there are things you can do to reduce felt recoil. Um, some of them involve the, the actual uh, dynamics of the action within the gun. Um, some of them involve things like muzzle devices. But there really there is no free lunch. If you've got you know the foot pounds going out the front of the gun are the same as the foot pounds coming back the other end, and you can play some games with that, and you can redirect them in various ways to a certain extent. But any you know, like you'll always have more recoil with a heavier cartridge, all else being equal. And frankly, a muzzle break is one of the better ways to deal with some of that recoil. So saying specifically that you're leaving out muzzle devices, that, that limits a lot of your options. Um, I would not expect that cartridge to shoot like 556. Uh, Grumpy Badger says, if the Savage 1907 and 45 Auto had been adopted instead of the Colt 1911, would Savage have had the same longevity and popularity as the 1911? Would some boomer at the range be telling me how his Kimber 1907 was a back-to-back -back World War champion? Possibly, but it's hard to say for sure. Uh, <clears throat> it certainly would have had a good start, because it would have gone through World War I. Um, we probably would have supplied them to a number of people during World War I, simply because of the requirement for arms that everybody had. However, like being adopted by the US military is only one element of really successful long-term lifespan of a firearm. Because, well, the Craig Jorgensen, for example, adopted by the US, not really around all that much today. I mean, they're around, but it's not like people are still building Craigs. John Browning was a really brilliant designer, and he came up with some really, really good, efficient, effective designs. And that's a large part of why the 1911 is still around. It's a Browning gun adopted by the US military, which is this perfect combination. So it's possible that the Savage could still be around. Um, in my opinion, the Savage was not quite as good of a gun as the 1911. Uh, but had we adopted it, it would have had the benefit of a lot more development and iteration, just because once the military had it they'd be relatively unlikely to get rid of it easily, and so they'd keep working on it and tweaking it, just like we saw the 1911A1 and then further eventual iterations on the 1911. So it's hard to say. Um, it would have been poised for long-term success, to be back-to-back -back world champions still built by a zillion companies today, but we'll never really know for sure. Gabriel says, if the Sten gun was developed in 1920 instead of World War II, uh, what design features would you expect it to have, i.e. caliber, bullpup or not, etc.? Um, I would expect it to be still in 9mm, it would take it might still, it might be its own proprietary magazine, Depending on who built it, it might be a pistol magazine, but I kind of doubt it. Um, it would definitely be largely polymer. It would be the same basic mechanism as the Sten, which is to say a fixed firing pin, uh, open bolt, full auto, maybe have a semi-auto setting like the Sten did, maybe not, but it would definitely be a polymer shell around a metal bolt. 
because the whole point of the Sten gun was very inexpensive mass production. So uh, how do we do that today if we are thinking more, you know, less expensive and faster than metal tubing and some stampings? It would be injection molded polymer. You can really crank those things out quickly once you have a factory set up to do it. So um, it would be something, you know, the thing that comes to mind is the UMP, but a lot less refined. So less fancy, much more simple sights, probably a worse trigger pull, less, it wouldn't have the sort of um, more modular uh, trigger components like HK typically does. It would have a very simple, you know, standalone trigger. And that's it. That would be the Sten gun of 2020, I think. Cody says, outside of your love of firearms and good liquor, like my Irish whiskey here, uh, do you have any other hobbies that you enjoy, such as cars running, cooking, collecting beer cans, etc.? I have some, but not a lot that I get to partake in all that much because the vast majority of my time is spent doing gun stuff, because it's what I really enjoy, and it's also my job. Um, I was a bagpiper. I started playing pipes when I was about 10 years old and continued through the end of high school. So I still have my pipes. I actually have Highland pipes and I have a set of um, indoor parlor pipes, but I'm way out of practice. I stopped doing that in college because in college I was in a dormitory and Highland bagpipes are not an ideal dormitory sort of instrument. Uh, I would like to get back into practice with those at some point, but I don't know when that'll actually happen. Um, I do a little bit of hiking every once in a while, horseback riding when I find someone who has a horse, because that's fun. I'm not really any good at it, but it's fun. Um, I am the pr in the process of getting a scuba certification, which I'm looking forward to. Um, I am of course going to immediately tie that into the channel. I'm looking forward to doing some really cool underwater video, like break out the spear guns. Um, what else? I've dabbled in a lot of things, but I don't know how many of them would rise to the level of a serious hobby. Uh, Bry MW uh, says, I feel like this has been brought up before, but what are some of the lubricants or grease used on firearms that you do video that you do in have in videos uh, as well as your own? This is another one that I've been asked a bunch, and I've always kind of set it aside because again, my answer isn't all that great. In this case, my answer is I don't really pay much attention to specialty lubricants. I use random gun oil. Like I have enough random like samples of various gun oils and stuff that I've just kind of inherited that I've basically never had to go out and buy gun oil and I don't have any, I don't see the value in the real specialty sort of snake oil lubricants that are out there. Um, we've done some video on some of that over on InRange, which I'll let you go check out over there. To my mind, kind of like oil is oil. I've seen some fairly persuasive arguments that if you really need it, like use synthetic motor oil. You know how much research and development went into that and how much harder, how much, uh, how much more stressful of a job it has to do in a vehicular engine than it would in a firearm? Like now I'm also not, you know, deploying to Afghanistan for a month at a time worried about, you know, if the gun does jam up in any way, it'll cost me my life. So. I've never really been in a position where I needed to pay really serious attention to getting just the right gun oil. Kyle says, <clears throat> were American enlisted men in the Second World War allowed to carry sidearms? We often hear stories of soldiers bringing pistols from home or capturing an enemy combatant's pistol, like a Luger or Nambu, and using it in combat. Was this practice condoned or frowned upon? That's something that would depend on the individual unit commander. I've heard a lot of stories as well about troops uh, who did both of those things, who captured souvenir pistols and carried them, and perhaps actually even used them, as well as people who had their family mail them a pistol from back home. Uh, and during the Second World War that would be a thing that, that would be up to your unit commander. Uh, and maybe to some extent like whether you paid attention to the unit commander. If you hide it well enough and nobody finds out about it, like what are they going to do? Yell at you again after you shoot a Nazi with your, you know, Smith and Wesson 38? Probably not. Or if they do, you probably don't care. Uh, and Americans had American soldiers had a real penchant for souvenirs. 
and picking up trophy pistols was a pretty common practice. So I suspect most of the time unit commanders were probably fine with it, as long as it didn't interfere with the other equipment that you were issued and supposed to specifically be carrying. Uh, Benjamin says, what other forgotten weapons have you studied besides firearms? Edged weapons, bows, siege equipment, etc. This is an easy one because the answer is nothing. Uh, I have dabbled in archery to the tiniest extent possible, including basically zero historical research into it. Um, I don't think I've ever handled a crossbow. Uh, I did, as a high school um, student, dabble in, in uh, siege artillery in the form of pumpkin chucking, but never very seriously and never successfully. Um, edged weapons I know basically nothing about, aside from the occasional bayonet. I have a grand total of two swords. I have a World War II uh, non-commissioned officer's katana, a Japanese sword. It's one of the ones machine-made. It's got, it's got the serial number is like 120,000 and change. Uh, and I have a U.S. Cal uh, patent saber, a 19, uh, 1912 U.S. cavalry saber that I had the opportunity to get cheap, and I figured, well, that's pretty cool. Like George Patton designed it as an Olympic fencer. Neat. I'll take that. But as for actually handling them. Basically nothing. Uh, Walker says, about a year ago you said that the market for water-cooled heavy machine guns was somewhat depressed and it would be a good time to grab them. Are there any NFA items in the same situation today that you would recommend as being good things to grab up while they're going cheap? Yes. So on the one hand, I would say water-cooled heavies are still a pretty darn good deal. Um, uh, some, of the old, some of the really obnoxiously heavy CNR machine guns are still less expensive than they used to be. I hesitate to say like they're cheap. They're not cheap, um, but if you're in that market, they've gone down. If you like those guns, this is, I still think, a good time to get them. The other thing that I find interesting though is thanks to uh, shoulder braces, there is a huge upswing in popularity of basically pistol caliber carbines and what would normally be short barreled rifles. So AR-15 pistols, AK pistols, a whole slew of newly developed uh, 9mm, maybe you know, to a lesser extent 45 caliber pistols that are kind of designed specifically for use with arm braces. They're PDWs and if they were full auto they would be submachine guns. Now the NFA connection here is ATF has uh, the ability now to e-file the paperwork to, to build an SBR, the Form 1 to make an SBR. And that cuts, like you go online and you fill out all the same sort of stuff that you would normally fill out on a paper form one, but the time to do that is about five weeks instead of like eight to ten months. So if you're interested in having a short railed rifle and you're willing to buy it as a pistol, run the paperwork yourself, you then have to engrave your name on it as a new manufacturer, uh, and then throw a stock on it, it's actually like comparatively quick to do it now. I hate to say, I mean, it's kind of weird to say it's super quick when it's four to six weeks to have it processed, but compared to the four to six months or more that we're used to seeing for NFA transfer times, like that's pretty cool. So I actually just did that. Um, I am filming this a little before it actually airs. Uh, but I just got back the stamp for my HK SP5. Rather than work with arm braces, I decided I really want to just shoot it from the shoulder like a proper carbine that it was designed to be. Uh, so I e-filed a Form 1 to register it as an SBR. Yep, it costs 200 bucks. Yes, it's registered. It also means, I mean, part of my motivation for this is that I'm on YouTube all the time. I am not going, I don't want to uh, misrepresent the use of an arm brace on a global video if I'm using it in a way that it wasn't actually designed for. So I want to shoot the things from the shoulder, I'm going to put a shoulder stock on it. And it's actually a pretty easy process to do that compared to what people would normally expect. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, what's cool is you have a huge number of options right now. Five years ago if you said I want a 9mm PDW that I can buy as a pistol with the short barrel already on it, file some easy paperwork, and then just throw on a stock, you wouldn't have had nearly the, the number of choices that you do today. 
Let's see, Timo says, do you try to make your cannon videos, like the Pac-40, the Bofors, or the German 1918 infantry cannon, uh, often, or are they more of a case of they have blank lying around, uh, I could make a video about that. I really like these videos, especially because smaller cannons or light artillery are rarely covered. Uh, I tend to do those whenever I have the opportunity. Uh, they're rarely things that I plan for. Um, a lot of them come up at there, there's one or there are one or two shoots every year that I try to get to where I don't ever know what's coming out, but there's almost always some cool artillery that shows up to be fired, and so I always try to do videos of those uh, because it's really hard to arrange videos of artillery. There's not that much of it out there, especially compared to machine guns or basic small arms, um, and especially when I have the opportunity to film something getting fired. So I did a few of them at drive tanks. Um, they had more guns than I filmed while I was there. I only had so much time and I focused on the ones I thought were the most interesting. We had a range shoot recently where they had the Soviet D-30, and that video has already aired as of uh, this going up. They also had a US M40 106mm recoilless rifle that we actually fired a couple of times, and so that video is coming. Anyway, the answer to Timo's question is uh, those are done on a case of, hey, I have access to that right now, I bet. I have enough research material that I can put together a useful and helpful video on it and film it right now. Uh, Yemen says, are there any weapons that you would refuse to do a video on, and if so, why? Um, not really, but sort of. It's like, no, but also yes. Uh, in general, uh, where I really hesitate is where I'm not really sure about the provenance of the weapon. Um, if it's something that is purportedly historical and valuable, I want to be 100% sure that it's legitimate and not reproduction, not fake, before I film it. So there are a number of guns that are widely faked that I don't have a whole lot of personal expertise on. A good example would be German sniper rifles, uh, World War II, um, Car 98K snipers. And I have tended to avoid doing those guns. In fact, I don't think I have any proper videos on that whole group because I just don't know enough about them myself to personally verify and be, be confident that a gun that I'm looking at is real. And especially when uh, a gun like that, a big part of the interest in the video is going to be, how do I tell if the one I've got is real? I want to compare it to the one that Ian's got on video. So it's very important to me that the one I get on video be legitimate, lest you know, I lead people astray. Um, beyond that, there aren't really any other... I can't think of any guns that like someone... If, assuming that it were of interest and appropriate for the channel, you know, if someone, if someone hands me a beat up Mossberg or a, a Ruger 1022, like, uh, there's really no good reason to put it on the channel. Um, but if it's a gun that has some historical or mechanical interest, as long as I'm sure that it's legitimate, I can't really think of anything that I would hesitate or refrain from fil uh, filming. Jim says, a guy has a rifle. Approximately 50,000 other guys have identical rifles. He looks and sees on the barrel of his rifle a proof mark. Exactly what does that mark mean? Was his rifle and the 50,000 others individually subjected to overpressure loading to ensure that it's safe when normal pressure cartridges were used? Yes, Jim, that's exactly what it means. Uh, in those countries that have proof houses, which is most of Europe and not the United States, that literally does mean that every single rifle with that stamp was individually proof tested with one or sometimes two, depending on the country and the standard, overpressure cartridges. Um, typically, so the way that originally worked was the government or a gunsmithing guild would set up a proof house and you could only sell guns in the public trade if they were tested by the proof house. So gun makers would bring their guns in, have them tested, get them back, and then they could sell them. With modern mass production, obviously, that doesn't work so well. You think like, okay, World War II Germany, the Mauser factory, are they going to crate every Car 98K off to some proof house? No. And what typically happens in those uh, circumstances is that the proof house will set up uh, basically an auxiliary station inside that factory, whether it's the Mauser factory or the FN factory or um, wherever it is. 
and they will do their proof testing as part of the manufacturing procedure. Now that proof testing is still overseen by employees of the proof house, not company factory employees, uh, so they, they can simplify you know, the process, the logistics of the process in that way. But yeah, those proof marks are every single gun individually tested. Next up is Mark, who says, what is your opinion on the etymology of rifles versus carbines in the post-horse cavalry world? Is the distinction merely institutional and role-based within a specific force? He goes on for a while. Um, basically what has happened since the cessation of horse combat is that carbine has split, and it now has two distinct meanings. A carbine could be a short version of a rifle, or a carbine could be a smaller caliber version of a rifle. And you'll see that in pistol caliber carbines, um, 9mm carbines. Kind of doesn't matter what length a 9mm carbine barrel is, we refer to it as a carbine. You don't generally hear about 9mm rifles. I know every once in a while, but in common usage, if you say, um, you know, an, an AR, a 9mm AR carbine, that doesn't mean that it's going to be a short barrel, it means the caliber is underpowered compared to the original 5.56 caliber of the weapon. Uh, but you can also hear about a 5.56 carbine, which would indicate a short barreled version of a typically long barreled gun. Both totally valid, it's an interesting etymological case. <clears throat> David says, I know Carl is not a fan of the M1 carbine due to issues he's experienced. What changes do you think could have been made to the design during World War II that would have ameliorated some or all of these issues? He has a second question we'll get to in a moment. I think the biggest thing that could have been done to remediate the M1 carbine, and I should I'll footnote this first by saying I don't think the M1 carbine was not considered a gun that had problems that needed to be addressed during World War II. The level of malfunction that it has in standard usage was considered perfectly acceptable, especially given that typically a malfunction on an M1 carbine means you rack the, the charging handle and it's good to go. Like they just they had a, a looser standard of reliability during the 1930s and 40s than we do today. We're spoiled today by gun designs that are really, really, really good. And I think this is reflected as well in automobiles. If you were to take you know, today's car and, and uh, use it as a standard of reliability and durability and then compare it to something built in the 40s, like holy cow, the stuff in the 40s was all complete garbage. So the M1 carbine, if the guns of the 40s were a lot better relative to the cars. Uh, at any rate, um, I think the thing that they could have done that would have reduced those malfunctions would be to improve the magazine design. If they had made a sturdier magazine, and you can look at other magazine designs using 30 carbine as the cartridge. Uh, the San Cristobal and the Beretta Model 57 magazines are both much heavier duty, much stouter. Those magazines are, are good solid mags. The M1 carbine magazine is pretty much a disposable item. And back when I talked to Ken Hackathorn about his experience talking to World War II vets about the M1 carbine, um, what they typically said was, yeah, they'd, they'd use some magazines for a week or two or a couple weeks, and then they'd just toss them and requisition new ones. And that was expected, that was normal. So had they given it a truly solid, you know, permanent reusable magazine, that would have fixed the issues. Now, uh, Mark's second, sorry, David's second issue is, do you think a cartridge like 5.7 uh, Johnson, 5.7 Spitfire, or similar small caliber high velocity type cartridge would have changed the application or appreciation of the M1 carbine at that time? No, if anything, I kind of suspect it would have been less desirable in a 5.7 millimeter cartridge at that time. I think the idea that it was 30 caliber was not bad. Um, it's moving at a high enough velocity that, I mean, that's it's like a 1900, 2000 foot per second bullet. You compare it to a pistol and it's way at the top of the charts. So I honestly, I don't think the gun would have gained anything from a rechambering for 5.7 Spitfire. Kind of interesting to note that as a commercial platform, 5.7 Spitfire was never all that popular and has almost is effectively completely dead today. 
John says, has anyone ever actually thrown a submachine gun just right to get the bolt to go back, scoop up around, and fire it? Or is there an actual real world occurrence of that happening aside from Jamie Lee Curtis in True Lies? Yes, but also no, once again. So the yes is that absolutely there are there were numerous cases of Sten guns in particular being dropped, hitting on the buttstock, and the bolt coming back far enough to pick up a cartridge, but not far enough to catch the sear, and then slam firing that cartridge. However, that rarely leads to more than one round being fired, because it either, um, most likely, the recoil from firing that cartridge will kick the bolt back far enough to catch on the sear, because the trigger isn't depressed at this point. So if the bolt comes all the way back, it'll lock open. It'll be ready to fire, but you'll have to pull a trigger to get it to fire a second round. It's hypothetically conceivable uh, that you could get just the right amount of pressure from that one round firing to kick the bolt back the same amount and get more than one, but the fact that this thing's going to be kind of bouncing around at this point makes it very unlikely that you would get more than a couple rounds worst case. In True Lies, the gun goes bouncing down a staircase and dumps the entire magazine. And in fact, I think it's one of those Hollywood magazines, it's like 50 or 60 rounds that it fires in the process. Um, we know these situations were, and it, well, it wasn't just that, it was also issues of uh, catching a bolt handle on something, if you're getting out of a truck, or climbing out of a tank, or otherwise you know, messing around with web gear, you catch the bolt handle, pull the bolt back just that right amount, and then the thing slips off of whatever it had caught on, that can also cause them to fire. And we know that these issues were substantial and real, because virtually every submachine gun that wasn't a totally crude Sten gun sort of thing, uh, was designed with a safety in mind to prevent that. Uh, with the Uzi, for example, we see the guns retrofitted with a ratcheting top cover to prevent that from being a problem after it initially was a problem, I believe largely with tank crewmen uh, coming out getting the, the charging handle uh, caught on the, the lip of a hatch on a tank, pulling the bolt back and firing. It doesn't take many of those situations, many of those incidents, before people decide to do something to fix them. Uh, Victor says... I wonder why there are so few submachine guns in bullpup configuration. If I remember well, there's only the Steyr AUG, as in a 9mm version, um, the P90 being more a submachine gun, or a, a personal defense weapon than a submachine gun, yet the 9mm AUG must be fairly good since it was adopted by the Belgian police. Why not more submachine guns in that configuration? And the answer is because the whole point of a bullpup is to get a full length barrel in a compact package. However, you need a, a long full-length barrel, and with bullpups we're typically talking 20-24 inches, because you're firing a high-pressure rifle round that really gets some benefit out of a long barrel. A 9mm parabellum cartridge really doesn't get any benefit out of a barrel more than about 8 or 10 inches, so you don't actually gain anything by using a bullpup configuration to give yourself a longer barrel. The reason that you have uh, a few of these guns, notably the Steyr AUG in 9mm, is because the gun was already being made, and it was an adaptation of the existing design to use 9mm. If the Belgian police had approached Steyr about a purpose-built 9mm submachine gun for the police forces, and the AUG hadn't already been designed and built in 5.56, they wouldn't have built an AUG specifically in 9mm, because a bullpup uh, in 9 by 19 just doesn't actually give you any real benefit. And you get all the downsides of a bullpup, namely uh, the lack of ambidexterity. Let's see, Turbo1889 says machine gun feed systems, belt, uh, spring-loaded box, drum, and pan magazines, and clips or strips. Are there any other feed systems? Um, that have da, 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 that have been tried without success. If so, what? There are a couple of others. Um, the Japanese Type 11 used a hopper full of rifle stripper clips, which is really cool and has some logistical, like I can see how that would make sense, um, but was ultimately not viewed successful enough to be repeated in any of the follow-on guns. Um, Degturev, the Russians, experimented with a DP-27 outfitted with a Japanese Type 11 style feed hopper, and it didn't go anywhere past uh, early prototyping. 
Um, there's also a really funky box, sort of box magazine that was used in the uh, Fiat Ravelli 1914, where it is, it's like a magazine cube where, where you have a whole series of, uh, I think they're six round, five round, I think they're five round, uh, single stack magazines. So you've got two feed lips, follower, spring, and five rounds. And then right next to it is another stack of five rounds and a separate box. And then, and you've got 10 of these in a row. And what happens is you load this thing in the side of the machine gun and it fires the first five rounds out of the single stack mag. And then there's a, a mechanism in the gun that indexes the whole box over one position. And it fires the next five rounds. And then the whole thing goes over again in the next five. And eventually it fires the last five and spits the thing out with the gun. So also super cool. And if you don't understand just from that description why nobody else decided to do that, you should play with one of those magazines and then I think you'll figure it out pretty quickly. Uh, incredibly finicky, complex sort of thing to deal with. Your one magazine has 10 springs, 10 followers, and 20 feed lips that you have to deal with. Um, in addition to that, there were a few uh, fixed box magazines where you had to open the magazine. This is, again, Italian, the, the Brita 30. Open the magazine, run a 20 round charger clip, stripper clip thing into it, and then close the magazine. Um, it's always the Italians actually with the weird stuff. The Brita 38 had a 20 round feed strip, but what was cool about it is it took the empty rounds and stuck them back in the strip. So a loaded strip went in one side and a strip full of empty cases came out the other side. That was done because it was a vehicular gun. And the theory was you didn't want all the empty cases rolling around on the floor where the crew members are maybe going to trip on them or they'll fall into something finicky. So those are the ones that come to mind. Um, the Japanese did also have an aircraft gun that was sort of a variation on the Type 11 feed system where it had like a, a big almost circular pan sort of thing that you would fill up with rifle stripper clips. And because of the taper of the cartridges and the rims, they kind of curved out like a Shosha magazine. So there was one of those. That's a gun I'd love to get my hands on. I know there's one at the Royal Armories, but I haven't had a chance to film it yet. Uh, Robert says, why is 3D printing not really used in firearms today? Uh, they're printing rocket engines, at least smaller ones, in New Zealand, so precision and strength can't be the only issues here. I'd think the flexibility gained by not requiring as much tooling would allow for easier switch between models. Uh, the issue with 3D printing is that it is very flexible, um, and it absolutely does allow for quick change between models, and that's why the primary thing that it's used for is prototyping. If you're iterating a design and you want to build one and try it, and then tweak the design and try another one, that is a huge headache to do with traditional machine tools. But 3D printers, you go into the, the program and you change a couple things and boop, print out another one. The problem is it's a time consuming process. If you have a CNC machine that's set up to make one part repetitively, it's going to crank them out way faster than a 3D printer will. So once you have a gun in mass production, you typically, it's not efficient to use 3D printing anymore, unless you're printing something that you can't really machine. For example, at SHOT Show this year, uh, Sig Sauer had this really cool display of 3D printed titanium rifle suppressors. And because they're 3D printed, they're able to use a, uh, an internal design that would be physically impossible to machine with traditional uh, you know, cutting tools. You can only make them with additive machining. And because suppressors have an artificially high price in the US because of the NFA, uh, it's actually cost effective for them to 3D print suppressors out of titanium, which is incredibly cool. And I think we can count that as one of the awesome elements of living in the future as we do. Let's see, Ian, not me, I didn't seed this question, different Ian. Um, are there any weird operating mechanisms that you have heard about or read about but haven't been able to find a remaining example of? Uh, yes, although they're not really old ones. Um, so there's the Shogren. I'm still looking for a Shogren shotgun for myself. The problem is I don't, I'm just not really willing to pay what the guns are worth on the open market. So eventually I'll find one and I'd love to tinker a little bit more with one of those. I've actually still yet to take one apart. 
Uh, but more, more substantial than that are some of the actual very recent Russian designs. I have yet to have a chance to tinker with any of the, uh, like not constant recoil, but the, the captive systems, the, the ba balance recoil systems that the Russians are experimenting with. And I think those would be very interesting to, to play with. So hopefully at some point, like every once in a while you hear rumors about one of those coming into the US um, for commercial sale, and eventually I think that will happen, and I look forward to it. Jeffrey says, given the adoption of the M27 IAR in the Marine Corps as the new light machine gun, is it likely we will return to an interwar or World War II light machine gun sort of thing, box magazine fed light machine guns on a larger scale, or is the IAR a notable exception to the rule of belt fed use? I think the IAR is generally an exception. I don't see a trend really of a lot of people dumping their belt fed guns to go to magazine fed support weapons. Uh, I suspect like in five or ten years someone in the Marine Corps will uh, take a look at the situation and have an epiphany that, wow, you know what? Our troopers are dramatic, you know, their their fire support capability is being dramatically limited by their box magazines. We could get them a belt-fed gun, and then they could have like three times as much firepower without having to change magazines. Like these two ideas just go back and forth continuously. I think belt-fed uh, has gotten to a point where the guns are light enough and simple enough and reliable enough that they tend to be the better option for most people. And that's why I think we see mostly belt-fed support weapons today, but it does bounce back and forth between the two. William says, given the Army's tendency to preferring its own designs over outside designs, do you think the AR-10 would have had a reasonable chance for selection as the M14, in place of what became the M14, if Stoner had had more lead time developing the platform? That's a tricky one. Springfield Armory really did have a bias towards its own internal designs um, in the 50s. But the AR-10 was, was doing pretty well. In fact, it was doing really well, especially in the eyes of outsiders looking at these tests. Uh, and ultimately what, what killed it for the AR-10 was its use of a composite barrel very early on. Uh, one of the rifles in Springfield, or in Aberdeen testing, I think it was, uh, had a bullet exit whew, out the side of the barrel. And there's a really impressive picture of it that you can find. Uh, the problem was under endurance testing, they had a composite barrel, and the two, the, the differential materials of the barrel ex heated at a different rate, expanded at a different rate, separated, and then the pressure was able to blow around right through the side. Had that not happened, there's a decent arguable chance that the AR-10 could have won adoption. Had Stoner been, you know, had more time to develop the platform, uh, he could have fixed that problem before it happened. Uh, Stoner himself was not a fan of the composite barrels and was vindicated. You know, not the way he wanted to be vindicated, but he was vindicated by uh, that mishap in the trials. It's possible. It would have been an uphill fight regardless, but yeah, I think it is possible that the AR-10 could have been adopted as the US Army standard weapon. Uh, Craig says, what do you think of Ruger bringing the 5.7 uh, and its effect on the price and development of the 5.7 by 28 cartridge? Ruger's this interesting company in that they build almost nothing that's really interesting. That's a horribly arrogant thing for me to say, but like every time you look at Ruger guns, you're like, oh, well, that's kind of boring. There's nothing cool to say about that. But then they're also a very stable, dependable, and successful gun company because they tend to build stuff that people who aren't super total gun nerds look at and go, oh well, yeah, that's that's what I want. Like that's relatively inexpensive. It does what I want it to do. It's gonna work. Boom. Like Ruger sells the crap out of a lot of really standardized bedrock sorts of utilitarian guns. And I think it's it's a pretty interesting idea of them to bring out a pistol in 5.7. I think it'll be a lot of fun for people to shoot, and that's going to sell a lot of pistols. I don't think it's really going to do anything for development of the cartridge. I think we're going to see the kind of the standard uh, non-armor piercing 5.7 uh, projectile and cartridge maybe come down in price if another you know if additional manufacturers decide to pick it up, uh, or if the gun does sell really well and you know ammo volume increases. But I don't think I don't think we'll see any real development because 
there aren't any tactical sort of security organizations that are going to jump at the chance to buy Ruger 5.7 pistols. Uh, Captain Coconut says, why was England so fixated with the Webley revolver? I understand it was a good gun, but they continued to use it through the Second World War when most countries had switched to automatics. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. The Webley was effective for the British. It was, it's a service sidearm. Like, it really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Uh, so if you've got it tooled up for production, and it's being made by a company that basically only makes revolvers, if you take Webley and Sons and have them start building, like, and say, okay, we don't need you to make revolvers anymore. Okay, yeah, you could get them to tool up to make Bren guns or something, but they don't have the industrial expertise. They're, they've got all the tooling, they've got the production lines. Have them keep making revolvers, and then you don't have to take any other production line that you have access to and turn it over to making some new semi-automatic pistol that may be 10, I don't know, 20% more effective. But 20% more effective in a military sidearm is still effectively irrelevant. Uh, Zachary says, why are companies debuting cool modern AKs at shot chambered in 7.62x39 instead of 545? The answer is 545 didn't really take on globally the way 7.62x39 did. Outside of Russia, not very many people actually adopted 545. Not really any really substantial countries. And we see most people who are using the AK platform internationally sticking to 7.62x39 or going to 556. So a lot of the development that's still being done, and a lot of these guns you're seeing introduced are being made by foreign uh, AK factories that do military production. While well, the guns they're producing for foreign militaries are often as not in 7.62, so makes sense. Provide that to the civilian market without giving yourself any additional workload. Eric says, how has an increased emphasis on training soldiers changed small arms? What are examples of capabilities and features uh, that a gun that make a gun better for better or poorer trained troops. First off, I'm I, I'm not entirely sure that we do have better training for soldiers today than we used to. Um, certainly, we have more training, but we're also dumping a lot more stuff on a lot of soldiers than they used to have. You know, there's this interesting comparison that the the gear weight. You know, you take the the total amount of junk carried around by an infantryman hasn't actually changed all that much from the Roman times until today. Uh, and if anything, today we're giving guys all sorts of technical gear. You, now you have lasers, you have optics, you have fancy radios, you may have some sort of visual tablet device. Uh, and all of this is has to be crammed into the same amount of training time that's available, which means small arms training is probably going to be one of the things that gets left in the dust. because. Well, you know, you can always put some time into the rifles eventually, but we have this fancy widget that we paid a lot of money for, and we want to make sure that the guys know how to use it or else it's a waste. And like the rifles are boring and old fashioned and they kind of get pushed down uh, in priority. So it's interesting, we have absolutely improved the capability of the small arms. The biggest single factor in that would be the universal issue of optical sights today, which is something that was not even conceived of really before about the 1950s, and even then only the British even considered it. Uh, and it was, uh, boy, it was what, like last 20 or 30 years when mass issue of optical sights has really become a, a thing uh, around the world. So that gives troops a greater capacity to find targets, but doesn't really improve fundamental accuracy. So in some ways, like, you're going to get guys shooting and missing more because they're going to see targets but still be unable to hit them if they're not really all that well practiced. It's an interesting subject to consider. Timothy says, do you know of a good English language resource detailing the development of the Soviet M43, 762 by 39 cartridge? Uh, the best that I can find are some Google translated Russian language websites that naturally aren't conducive to technical study. The best book that I am aware of that's out right now uh, is a book by an author named uh, Bolotin called Soviet Small Arms, I believe. I'll put a picture of it up over there. Um, it is all in English. It's, it's a quite good book. I think it probably needs some updating at this point, 
but it covers a lot of interesting and unusual stuff. That said, of course, uh, the book that we at Headstamp are going to be publishing by Max Popienker uh, should be better than Boatine. So keep an eye out for that when it comes up, probably in about a year, I hope. Ryan says, the Sentry Arms import and conversion of the Moss 4956 into 308 was a mess. Yes it was. How could Sentry have handled that better? New barrel instead of rechambering? Unfortunately for Sentry, there is no way that they could have handled it better. Uh, what they did was duplicate the best sort of conversion that the French military tried to do, and it didn't work for the French military, there was no way that it was going to work for Century. Really the problem is that 7.5 French is, has a, a much lower pressure curve to it than 7.62 NATO. And so the system would be fine if it were originally built for 7.62 NATO, but once you have the gun in 7.5, scaling it up, there's really no good way to do it. The problem is even if you rebarrel it, the barrel itself wasn't the problem. The problem was the bolt velocity moving backwards. So maybe reducing gas port size, moving the gas port around, you could tinker with something like that. The problem is at that point your solution is not cost effective. And the only things that Sentry would be interested in in, in rechambering these guns is if they can do it cost effectively. Uh, because they're looking for a profit margin. Like, how many, gun, how many more guns will we sell if we can make them in 308 as opposed to 7.5 that's hard to get? When you double the cost all of a sudden they don't care anymore because it's more profitable to just sell fewer guns in 7.5 than dump a lot of money into converting them. Uh, Tristan says, do you think bullpup shotguns are worthwhile? We own a KSG and despite initial safety issues with the pump motion, it does save a lot of room uh, even with the new, newer long barrels. Trigger is meh, but it's a shotgun. I'm not really super excited about bullpup shotguns. Um, I just don't, like, the point of shotguns is only for very compact packages. And if I want to be, you know, if I need to use a shotgun in a very tight, tight quarter sort of space, I'll just throw the stock under my arm instead of shouldering it. And maybe I just, like, the KSG isn't the world's most reliable shotgun. Their Teltex new one, the single barrel one, is also had significant teething issues. I haven't found, and, and there aren't a whole lot of other bullpup shotguns out there, so of the ones that do exist none of them really excite me all that much. And our last question is from George, who says, have there been any successful short recoil submachine guns? Yes, I can think of one off the top of my head, and that is the Furrer MP41-44, uh, developed by the Swiss, uh, by Adolf Furrer in, uh, in the Bern factory, Waffenfabrik Bern, and he was a huge, he was kind of obsessed with toggle locking, like the Luger, and he developed a short recoil toggle locked 9mm submachine gun, which I actually had the opportunity to do a video on and then also shoot uh, out in Switzerland courtesy of the Kessler Auction House. So uh, I will close out with a little bit of shooting footage of a Fur MP4144. This was of course, as you would expect, a tremendously expensive submachine gun for a submachine gun uh, and was would not have been successful were it not for Fur's connections to get a contract for the gun for Bern. Nobody else adopted it, the Swiss didn't keep it really after the war. So um, we'll close out on that. Thank you very much to all the patrons who submitted questions here. If you'd like to get your own question in, uh, go ahead and sign up over at Patreon to help support the channel. There's a link to that in the description text below. Thanks, and I'll see you with another Q&A next month.